Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit.
four-letter word, but it means a ton of stuff. Right? It has a ton of history for each and every one of us. Okay, so let's do a little prayer, and then we're going to light the candles and do the meeting. Okay? Dear God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for all the love that we experience and that we share together. We give you thanks for the people who love us and for the people who we love in this great big community who loves us always. Help us never to forget that your love is there forever. Um, good stuff. Okay, so we're going to read the scripture passage from John this morning. Uh-huh. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send his son anymore into the world to condemn the world, but not but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already. Because they do not, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the Dutch judgment that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Can we join together in saying the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray? Our Father.
Sunday morning to all who have come to worship on this fourth Sunday of Advent. It is not but sheer delight to be with you again after a hiatus of some seven or eight months. The last time I stood here was in April of this year and it's December again. Thank you for having me today. I thank Gabrielle for allowing me to share the service with her today. I apologize for Lydia's absence today. She has not been well and I have shared some of that with some of you. I am here to read a prayer of confession. In this Advent season, we each play a part in the unfolding drama of Jesus' birth. We are more likely to be found as harried, tense innkeepers than adoring shepherds at Jesus' side. Let us confess the distance from the love and worship of our Saviour that we have allowed to take place and so we are unable to accommodate the needs of others. Let us pray in a prayer of confession. God in whom all hearts find welcome, we confess that we have not yet made room in our hearts for the Christ child. We find the coming birth yet another event in our crowded lives. Like the harried innkeeper who had to refuse the couple a decent shelter, we find ourselves juggling people and obligations, torn between our compassion for the needy and the reality of what little we can do to bring comfort to all who ask of us. Like the innkeeper, we often relegate Christ to some out-of-the-way corner of our lives without really intending to. Like Bethlehem at census time, we have little room for anything we have planned for. God, in whom all our hearts find shelter, have mercy upon us. Help us in the midst of our busy, burdened lives to welcome the one who always has time for us. Amen. And now let us hear these words of assurance. <coughs> Jesus, our Saviour, says, Let not your hearts be troubled. In my Father's house are many rooms. I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, you may be also. Friends, the love of God is full of room, full of welcome. Know that you are forgiven. Receive the welcome of God where you will always find shelter. Amen. So be it. Thank you. 
Just a reminder that uh, we'll join your worship with Thomas and Carrie on December 30th. She's filling in for me while I'm away and is looking forward to leading everyone in worship on the 30th and the 15th of January. So she's eagerly awaiting leading us all. And with that, as we have been blessed by God, let us now return our gifts to God. Our offerings will be received.
were those who feared him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought up, but he has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich empty away. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. According to the promise he had made for ancestors to Abraham and to his descendants forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Unexpected guest. There's something in this story that stops the gospel. It slows everything down and points to details, highlighting this moment and its importance in the greater scheme of the story. See, now that Matthew and Luke are drawing off of Mark and their other sources, we have a first story that comes not in Mark, but shared by Matthew and Luke. Now in Mark's gospel, everything is, and then, and then, and then, in these little snippets, it's details and bullet points, and the story moves quickly. If this happened, and then that happened, and this happened, and all to get to the crucifixion and resurrection, Luke slows the story down. And he dives into this particular portion and gives us all these details. And we have to stop as readers and think, why? Why is this happening? What is the significance of this story? It makes us pay attention. So the angel has just come to Mary and told her that she will be overshadowed by the Holy Spirit and filled with child. This young woman, who in Greek is called a virgin and in Hebrew is called a young woman. The angel says, don't be afraid. It's the mystery of the gentle, humble nature that draws together this beautiful idea of the Holy Spirit and God and Mary's child with Greek mythology. They're intertwining in ways that people understand. But what comment follows? Here is Mary, presented with this terrifying idea of being with child, and not only with child, but God's child. And for people who would have run in fear, she says, Instead, here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be done according to your word. She's not fully understanding yet what is to come in the life that she has now committed to. She's not afraid of the comments that will follow. The snickering or messes as she walks down the village street. A young woman with a child, a young woman who is unmarried and proclaiming to be carrying the Messiah. It is a representation of what is to come, a face of the lowly. Do you think if this big Messiah, this powerful person, this powerful man that is coming to be, God is sending salvation to his people, it would come as it has come through the temple. And here again we see the contrast of John the Baptist, born to Zechariah, who we talked about last week, kind of sticking it to the man, going against his father as ruler of the temple, a high priest, and going up to the people and proclaiming the gospel. Here comes Jesus up from the lowly, up from the peasants, born outside the temple. And the story shifts again. All these patterns that people are used to hearing, all those archetypes that we understand and we know, are suddenly changed. And though this is enough for Mary, it's the story of two women, the story of the boldness and bravery of Mary. It's the difference in communication. 
show up at your door? Or who would you go to in a time of trial such as this? Who is the first person you call? Who is the one you pick up the phone and have to tell right away? See, Mary, in this situation, is on the edge. Really, what should have happened is she should have been stoned according to law if she had committed adultery and become pregnant outside of wedlock. Never mind for the man who was betrothed to with Joseph. This isn't a socially acceptable thing at the time, and the consequences are severe. But instead, she reaches out. Instead, she puts on her sandals and starts on a journey. Another thing women at the time wouldn't do, this isn't safe, let alone go out in her condition, alone and pregnant and unmarried, she decides to walk the 157 kilometers from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Now even by today, I don't know many young women who would just walk at the door and with their backpack and decide to walk a day and a half to their friend's house looking for help. Not such a brilliant idea at the best of times, let alone at a time where women are not treated as people and certainly not given any rights as pregnant, unmarried women. So who does she need? And here's the importance of this dialogue. It's not just a time to think as she starts out the door to the hill country. It's rocky and it's treacherous and there are people who would rob or steal or kill her easily. But she sets up with this internal dialogue with herself. It's a time to think and to wonder, to ask and to forgive, to explain. And she's looking for someone to be together with. And she doesn't need an explanation. She's not looking for a lecture or for a solution, but instead for companionship. And she reaches out to the woman she knows will understand best. And along the way, you have time to start thinking. See, a day and a half on foot through the mountains isn't an easy go of it. And at the same time, there's no guarantee of acceptance at the other end. 160 kilometers is a long way to go to have a door slammed in your face. Because Elizabeth could have easily said, uh, I don't know, Mary, this is really too complicated. I don't want to get in the middle of it. My husband is a high priest. This doesn't look well on a social standing. It's, it's awkward and uncomfortable, and I don't approve. Will she get there and be rejected? She could have given up before she even left the door and decided, I'm going to shut myself up and hold myself in and have this baby here and not worry about it. She could have shut the world out instead. And how is it that when we shut the world out, we also shut ourselves in? But instead, Elizabeth opens the door and greets Mary full of joy. And not only joy, but the expectation that Elizabeth has of who is coming and who the child she is carrying will be, leaps for joy. And here is where Elizabeth is vital to the story of Christmas, in relationship to the, to the God that is coming, to the salvation that is coming. It's a knock at the door in a desperate situation. And instead of having that door slammed in your face, it is opened and you are received with love. So here is where we miss an important story because there is no Elizabeth in the nativity scene. There are the three wise men and Joseph and Mary but Elizabeth, who has welcomed this young woman in and cared for her, and Mary cared for Elizabeth in her pregnancy, there's something missing that she's not present in this birth story. She should be in the background somewhere attending to Mary. 
baby and helping out and making sure she's comfortable. But we often forget about it. So like God and like this salvation, Elizabeth is there to represent the open arms that Mary in her desperation falls into. That knock at the door looking for help and she is welcomed in for as long as she needs. For as long as you need, Mary. Stay as long as you like. So here we have the situation of risking love. Where are we bold enough to risk that love? To love others? In the face of what anybody else says or in the face of what anybody else may think. <coughs> and along with that goes the permission we give ourselves to love ourselves. And all the complicated stuff that goes along with that. When we can love ourselves enough to trust and have faith in the path that God has set for us, where do we welcome love in? Instead of shutting it out, instead of keeping it on the periphery. Elizabeth of the world makes that easy. But the Elizabeths of the world are often neglected. They're often left out or unthanked. So here we get a thanks for all those of you who would be Elizabeth. Who would welcome in with loving arms and support. And we are reminded of the strength of Mary. Not only in her faith in welcoming this child and carrying a baby that would be the Messiah. But for walking that long way to Elizabeth and having faith that she will be welcomed in. The strength and faith of a young woman, and it reminds us of our worth and the beauty of Christmas, and how life matters, and how we are loved, and how we are cherished, and how God promises to be with us always. So when that knock on the door comes, and the people on both sides wonder what's next, we can be reminded of the life of a Messiah born to a young woman who grows up and is found in the temple, who grows up and starts to challenge the powers that be, who grows up to be a man who is hanged on the cross with Mary at his feet. Till again, three days later, the door opens and life emerges. The sign of hope and joy sing out. There is a knock at the door. It is opened and the story continues. Amen.
as we come to this table, we are reminded that this is the table of Jesus Christ, a banquet prepared for everyone, all who seek to be nourished and sustained in the journey of faith, all who seek wholeness and compassionate path to peace and justice, are welcome here. God be with you. And also with you. We lift our hearts in prayer. We lift our hearts in prayer. Let us give thanks to God. It is good to give our thanks and praise. Blessed are you, breath of spirit, giver of all life, source of love that knows no boundaries. Your song of wisdom rang out before the world began. Throughout the ages, your song of liberation has impregnated us with your hope for a world where those considered last and least are first and most. Violence is overcome by the power of your ancient love and all siblings work together for peace. You bring our longings to birth and send prophets to awaken us to your approaching advent among us. We thank you for those who, like Mary, have the strength and courage to give birth to your love in the world. For those who, like the shepherd, dare to seek out the child of Bethlehem. For those who, like the wise ones, actively challenge violence and oppressive power. We praise you that your everlasting light is shown to us in womb and tomb, in cradle and cross, in tenderness and compassion, we join in the Advent prayer of all people, O come, Emmanuel. And as we wait and watch for your coming among us, we proclaim your goodness. Let us sing together the first verse of O come, O come, Emmanuel. So we 
we pray. Come, come Holy Spirit, Spirit, come. And so we join with our siblings around the world in the prayer of Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, and we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The body of Christ. The lifeblood of Christ, the cup of blessing. Let us eat and drink together for our strengthening of the faith and for the sake of the world. Come for all is now ready.
body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ poured out for the sins of many. Drink this, remembering that Christ died for you, and feed on him with love in your heart. Let us pray for the healing you have given us in the brokenness of bread and the pouring out of cup. We thank you for the community that you have restored in us through the sharing of life. We thank you for the courage and strength that you have promised to us even as we have honored the one of courage in our own past. We thank you. Send us forth from this place in love, letting justice be worked out with gentleness and power known in the presence of your Spirit. Amen. I want to take a moment to do something that I feel falls to me as the elder. <laughs> There is a Norwegian poet whose name I do not recall. And one of the things he said was that older men should bless younger men. Well, I want to change that slightly and say older people should bless younger people. I want to extend my blessing to Gabrielle today as I have come with her to celebrate the sacrament. She could have done it herself, but the church has ruled that the elder should bless the younger. And that's why I'm here today. Gabrielle, the blessing I want to give you today <coughs> is that you are a fine preacher. And I was blessed to listen to you today. And I want to say to you, I will come back to hear you again. Thank you. You may continue with the worship. Permission, thank you. Let us read from this place, full of the hope, peace, joy, and love that we celebrate through the Advent season, looking forward in anticipation to the coming Christ tomorrow on Christmas Eve. Go filled and be reminded that God is with us in life, in death, in life beyond death. And you are loved beyond all time of it. Go in peace.